One of the most famous sagas of Icelanders is Brennu Njal Saga, or the saga of Burned Njal. This saga involves hundreds of named characters and is extremely long, longer than any other saga of Icelanders. There are several translations available. The one that I prefer is by Robert Cook. That is what I assign when I teach sagas classes. And in this series of videos, what I want to do is not review the entire course of Njal Saga, because that would be like reviewing the entire course of a very long novel, but rather to kind of give a signpost to kind of act as a little bit of a guide through the main action of the saga. As it can be difficult to follow, especially if you're only reading it the first or second time. Uh, there's so many characters, uh, many of them get introduced before they ever do anything, and then of course, being an Icelandic saga, there's an obsession with genealogy, and uh, you get a lot of names. You just don't really need to follow the action. So, the first major characters that we meet are Hoskuld and Hrut. They are brothers, or half-brothers, and in the saga of the people of Loxerdal, Loxdula saga, uh, they are also major characters. In that saga, we learned that Hoskuld did not think that Hrut was his legitimate brother, so when their mother died, Hoskuld actually denied Hrut any part of the inheritance from her. But that, that tension is in the past once we get to uh, Njal's saga. In Njal's saga, Hoskuld and Hrut are at a feast in the first chapter when Hoskuld is admiring his beautiful young daughter, Hagerd, and he asks his brother Hrut, don't you think that my daughter is beautiful? And initially Hrut refuses to say anything, but after being pressed, Hrut finally says, she's certainly beautiful and many men will pay for that, but what I don't know is how a thief's eyes came into our family. Hoskul is upset at this uh, implication, but uh, the saga continues. And so the next event that we read of is Hrut's proposal to a man named Mord Gigya, or Mord Fiddle, that he will marry his daughter, Uun. Uh, the marriage is agreed to, but Hrut soon finds out from a uh, visiting uncle, I think it is, that his brother has died in Norway and left an inheritance to him that Hrut needs to go and claim before his enemies do. And so Hrut agrees with Mord Fiddle that they will postpone the wedding and he sails to Norway, where he is, uh, he is greeted in splendid fashion by King Harold Greycloak and by his mother, Queen Gunhild, uh, Harold Greycloak's mother and wife of Eric Bloodaxe, previous king, and Harold Greycloak's father. Uh, to make a long story short, Queen Gunhild becomes quite taken with uh, Hrut. She actually helps him uh, get this inheritance that he's there to get, uh, but she also insists that he spend nights with her, and uh, after some time in Norway, uh, Hrud is prepared to go. He's gained, of course, the favor of both the king, because he's an awesome warrior, and the queen, because they have sexual relations, and the queen curses him on his way back to Iceland. She asks him first, oh, are you going back because you have a girl out there? And Hrud says, no, I don't. And she says, no, I'm pretty sure that you do. And as he's about to leave, she puts her arms around his neck and curses him that he will never be able to have sexual pleasure from the woman he intends to marry back in Iceland. Although he can have sexual pleasure from other woman, women, she says. So Hrut goes back to Iceland, a friend of kings and queens, a rich and accomplished man, and he marries Un. But at the wedding, everyone notices that Un, his bride, seems unhappy. Well, after a year or so, uh, at the all thing, the annual uh, festival and Supreme Court of Iceland rolled into one. Uh, Un meets with her father, Morth Fiddle, and she weeps when he asks how things are going with uh, her husband. She won't tell him any details why she's upset. So he goes and asks around with neighbors of, of uh, Hrut and Un, asking, you know, why is my daughter upset? Is, is her husband mistreating her? Uh, but everyone says, no, she's treated her very well. Um, she has all the freedom in the house that she wants. He eventually interviews Hrut and Hoskold and asks them, what are you doing to my daughter? Why is she upset? And uh, Hrut says, well, if she has an accusation to bring, let her bring it. But she won't say. And so uh, Morth Fiddle sends his daughter home with Hrut, saying, you know, go home. All the evidence favors him rather than you. 
But a year later, she goes back to the all thing and again weeps when her father asks her how things are going with her husband, Groot. This time he manages to get an answer out of her and she says, well, when he comes near me, his penis is so large that we cannot engage in coitus. But by the end of this, uh, he shows that his nature is the same as other men. And I think I know what that means, but the saga doesn't clarify. And <laughs> Morth Fiddle says, well, this is definitely grounds for divorce. Uh, let's arrange this so that you can divorce him. Now, the saga is depicted a world in Viking Age Iceland in which men and women have the freedom to divorce, but they typically must provide some kind of grounds or reason for it. Uh, and they also must declare in front of witnesses. So, Morth Fiddle says, go back home, and for the next year, act like everything is fine with Root. Be very sweet to him, he'll think everything has changed. And then, when he leaves to come to the All Thing a year from now, you must name witnesses and declare yourself divorced from him, um, and then come to me. And so she does this a year later, and uh, of course this humiliates Root. I'm pretty sure she names uh, the reasons, although I don't recall the saga actually specifically mentioning that. At any rate, Root is humiliated. It's humiliating enough to be divorced, um, especially in this culture. Uh, you know, it carries a lot of connotations about one's manhood. So, uh, this concludes Hoskuld and Root's uh, turn as the main focus of the story. But later, Un and her child, Morth, by uh, her second husband, Volgard, will continue to be important characters, and Hrut and Hoskul also continue to be important characters themselves. The saga now turns from focusing on Hrut to focusing on Halgareth, his niece, Hoskul's daughter. Halgareth is initially married to a man named Thorvald when he proposes to Hoskul for the hand of his daughter, but Hoskul does not ask Halgareth whether she's willing to marry him. This is always going to turn out to be a disaster in these sagas, anytime the woman is not consulted by her father. Who has the right to marry her off, uh, but typically it's considered good form to consult with a daughter. So she's married to Thorvald uh, unwillingly, and she goes to live with him, and her foster father, a very difficult personality named Theostol, goes to live with her at Thorvald's place as well. And Hogareth is a really uh, wasteful bride. She spends uh, too much money, she buys luxuries. Of course, these are medieval Icelandic luxuries, which things like dried fish and flour. Um, at an extraordinary rate, and by the spring, Thorvald says, you know, I'm running out of fish, and this is your fault. And she says, well, it's not my fault that you and your father used to starve yourselves. And he slaps her. Well, she says she'll remember the slap, but Thorvald goes out and goes fishing anyway. Theostolf, Holger's foster father, comes in and asks why her lip is bleeding, and she explains what's happened. And so Theostolf goes out to where uh, Thorvald is fishing and kills him with his axe. Come back, comes back in, uh, Hawkeith asks Theostolf, why is your axe bloody? This is the kind of question that gets asked a lot in this story. Um, and he says, I have done something that will allow you to marry a second time. Before long, Hawkeith is married a second time, this time to a man named Gloom. Uh, Gloom and Hawkeith actually get along well, and initially, on Hrut's advice, uh, Theostolf does not go to live with them like he did when uh, Hogarth married uh, Thorvald, her first husband. Uh, however, after a little while, Theostolf shows up, having been kicked out of Holskuld's place where he's been living because he's just a jerk. And uh, again, Hogarth and her new husband Gloom actually get along, but at one point, uh, when she is arguing with, with her husband that he shouldn't be sending Theostolf out to do slaves' jobs, like gathering up sheep and things like that, he slaps her. She tells Theostolf, don't do anything about this, don't come between me and my husband, but he just grins and goes out and helps Gloom uh, find some lost sheep, but along the way they get into an insult battle and Theostolf kills him. He comes home and she asks, why is your axe bloody? And he says, well, uh, you know, your husband is dead. And she says, well, you're the one who killed him then. And he says, yes. And he says, what advice do you have for me? And she says, go to my uncle Hrut. He isn't sure this sounds like great advice because, of course, Root uh, is a wise man who does not like uh, the nasty character that Theostolf is, but he goes nonetheless, shows up at Root's place in the night. Uh, Root asks who it is at the door, and it's Theostolf, so Root 
takes a sword in one hand and then wraps his left hand in a blanket, busts out the door and uses that blanket to knock the axe uh, Theostolf is carrying out of his hand and then kills Theostolf with his sword. And everyone praises Hrut for getting rid of the troublemaker Theostolf. Now another thing to mention is that when Un and uh, Hrut were divorced, more the fiddle, Un's father, sues Hrut for the uh, money and property that, according to their prenup, was supposed to belong to Un in the event that they divorced. Uh, there's a lot of things like prenups and lawsuits in these sagas that sometimes surprise people. It's not just people chopping people's axes. In fact, they can be really law and ordery. Uh, and Hrut refuses to pay. He actually challenges uh, Morth Fiddle to a duel uh, rather than pay him that amount. And uh, when Morth Fiddle won't duel him because Hrut is a powerful warrior and Morth Fiddle is kind of an old man, uh, this results in lasting shame for him, but he can't defeat him at the duel. The duel trumps the law, so uh, they cannot uh, recover Uin's property and money from Hrut. All right, well now, Un is becoming uh, very poor because she spent all of her money and she starts thinking about how she can actually get that money and property that uh, Hrut owed her after the divorce. And she goes to a relative of hers named Gunnar. This is Gunnar Holmundersson of Hlitherendi. He's introduced as a fantastically handsome and brave and powerful and great warrior. Uh, he can jump higher than anybody, even wearing armor. He can swing a sword so fast it looks like there's three swords in the air. He can swim like a seal. He's just introduced as someone that, if I recall the quote correctly, there's no point in competing at any sport with. He's just a superman. So she goes to him and asks if he'll help recover this property and money from Root. And so he goes to his friend Njol, an old man who is a great friend and counselor of Gunnar, to ask for a plan how he can get this property. And in the next installment, I will look at the adventures of Gunnar, who becomes the saga's next central focus character, uh, and his uh, turn in the spotlight begins with his recovery of the property from Hrut, along with the help of his friend Njal, who gives him a really convoluted plan of how to do this. For now, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.